welcome to Down the Road. A lot of things have happened since the last time we got a chance to visit. Um, you've got a withdrawal in Afghanistan. Uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Uh, you've got a verdict in the Twin Cities. It's guilty, it's guilty, and it's guilty. Uh, guilty of second-degree murder, guilty of third-degree murder, and guilty of second-degree uh, manslaughter. So, you know, I don't know where you were at when it came to that. If you had made up your mind, I had. And I had said it as we've gone down the road together. I, I thought, and I still believe, that Derek Chauvin uh, had committed murder. And now a jury agreed with me. So we want to talk about that. Well, we're going to get a chance to visit now with Scott Brand with Nielsen Brand Law Firm. And he's in studio with me. Scott, good to have you coming down the road with us. Thanks for having me, Joel. Did the verdict surprise you? Uh, to a certain degree, it did just because it felt like it came down really quick. It was guilty on every count. But when I was talking with other uh, friends in the legal community, we all thought that there would be a level of guilt uh, for something. But it came down swift. It was decisive. He's guilty on all three counts. So when a verdict comes that quick, is it usually a sign that a guilty uh, verdict is going to come behind it? There's a lot of different thoughts when it comes to that, but I've had my quickest verdicts for not guilty actually come, and the ones that have taken longer have been the ones that have come back guilty. So my personal experience is probably the opposite. But in a case like this, I think the conventional wisdom was that the quicker they come back, the more likely it's going to be guilty. So you had two people making cases, right? You had the, you had the defense, you had the prosecution, and the right. prosecution had... Uh, in their uh, lapel pocket, something that they could pull out, which was that video. Uh, that video that showed uh, the Derek Chauvin, uh, Chauvin, Chauvin, I've been calling him Chauvin, but uh, uh, knelt on George Floyd's neck for over nine minutes. How powerful was that? I think it was very powerful. And, and sometimes I think the, the defense that the, or sorry, the argument that the prosecution made too was just look at it, you know, and that that's strong enough sometimes when you as a prosecution, you have compelling evidence. You just put that in front of the jury and you have to trust that they'll come to a rational conclusion. And they did, I think, in this case. That video is extremely compelling evidence. So the, the defense tried to make the case, you know, just trying to get some reasonable doubt amongst that jury. You know, all they needed was one out of the 12, you know. So they tried to make the case that it wasn't uh, through... Um, you know, basically the kneeling on the neck, that there's other reasons that, that caused his death. How hard is that? I mean, you've been a defense attorney. You've, you've seen, uh, you know, instances where you've had to make that argument. Everybody deserves a good defense. But how hard is it with a video like that to try to make that argument? You have to try and look at everything that the case gives you, essentially. And in, uh, I feel like with that video, they didn't have a whole lot to work with. But as you said, uh, everyone's entitled to a good defense. You have to try and make what you can of it. And oftentimes, defense attorneys go to that uh, argument that you have to prove this beyond a reasonable doubt. There's no clear legal definition for that either. So if you can make that goalpost further and further away, it can sometimes make the jury's decision harder to make. So if you're Derek Chauvin and now you're sitting back and you've heard guilty, guilty, and guilty, um, what are your options? Well, be, right away people start talking about an appeal. Um, that will happen. Uh, but first he has to start handling the sentencing component of this. He can't appeal until after he's been sentenced. So he's going to be talking with his attorneys. They're going to start filing briefs because there's other things when talking, especially in Minnesota, you have uh, sentencing factors that you have to consider and whether or not certain factors apply that can enhance your penalty. So what I'd be thinking about right now if I was de his defensive team, of course you're going to be thinking about appeal long term, but right now you've got to try and mitigate that damage and try and get the smallest sentence that you possibly can for your client. So a lot of people are wondering, because as I mentioned, guilty, guilty, and guilty, you right. know, why all three charges? Why when you're guilty of second degree murder, isn't that enough? I mean, that's by far the largest crime. That's the largest penalty he's going to have to play and, uh, pay, I should say in terms of uh, years in prison, you know, why the other cases as well? 
Well, uh, and as you kind of alluded to, sentencing-wise, it's really not going to matter that much. The the main charge that he was convicted on is going to be the driving force in figuring out how much time uh, Mr. Chauvin's going to have to spend in custody. Um, but there's a variety of reasons why you might want to bring multiple charges. If on the appellate level, someone's going to want to contest that. If one of them has to go away, the other ones stick. Um, in North Dakota, sometimes the way that we do it is we have lesser included charges. And if you, you if you look at them, obviously there's lesser included charges here. And in North Dakota, you can stop after you found the more serious charge, but Minnesota has the rules run a little bit differently. Okay, so just so I understand, he's he's not going to get time for the, the second degree murder and then time added on for the the you know, the third degree murder. Basically we're looking right. at one crime, one one verdict here. Essentially that's correct, yeah. Okay. So you said that we're in sentencing mode now. Eight weeks from now, what is the judge going to decide based upon? Well, he's going to have to decide, to answer your question shortly, just how much time Mr. Chauvin's going to have to spend. Um, but he's going to have to consider a variety of factors to come to that conclusion. Um, there'll be briefs from the attorneys that will argue whether certain enhancements should apply um, or whether they should not apply. And um, he's going to have to take into account that video that we've all seen, the evidence that was presented. I mean, the jury decided guilt here, but he's, he saw all of the evidence as well. So he's going to factor in everything that he experienced. He's going to factor in uh, other cases that he's seen, that if there's anything similar to this, and that's what he's going to have to decide on. What was the, the toughest, other than the, the, you know, the video? We, we all know it was the video, but... When, when you look back at the case that the prosecution made, what stood out to you? What did you look at and say, look, that, that was really well done? I think it was the fact that they had other people come in and say, this is not consistent with how we do business. Um, in other there, words, law enforcement testifying against law enforcement. Yeah, I think that was compelling because one of the things I saw the defense try and do was say, hey, this is consistent with our training. What, what should a reasonable officer do in this situation and they had they had witnesses come in and say hey this is not our training this is not reasonable this is not how uh, the situation with mr. Floyd should have gone down they, they tried to make the argument on the defense side that uh, that you know mr. Chauvin Chauvin I'm gonna use Chauvin for now on because okay. that's what we're gonna <laughs> use today uh, that Derek Chauvin was um, in fear that look there was a mob there that was forming and and because of that mob, he had to keep control of the situation. I don't know how you do that. I, I don't know how you do that with, with uh, the suspect, in this case, George Floyd, in handcuffs. And you look back, the people that were recording Scott were the same people that were talking to him at the scene. Right. It, they didn't sound as though, in fact, when you, when you hear them now, one of the regrets they have was that they physically didn't get involved. And so I don't, I don't see how that argument can be made. It, well, obviously it didn't fly with the jury, right? Because they came down with a different conclusion. And I, being in fear that a mob's going to do something, I don't believe justifies you to keep pressure on someone's neck for that long. Uh, if, if we want to take his argument to its logical conclusion, then we knew to control the situation, he could de-escalate. And that did not happen in this case. The pressure continued, and ultimately a man lost his life because of it. This is only the second time in the history of Minnesota that law enforcement was found guilty of excessive force and of, of base, I shouldn't say excessive force, of taking someone's life like this. And, a, and so, you know, that tells me that, you know, this case is going to be looked at in terms of training, in terms of affecting uh, how uh, police does their job. Um, do you think law enforcement as a whole across the nation changes because of this? I hope so. I mean, it, it's it, if we don't learn anything from this as a society as a whole, not just law enforcement, then I don't know what the point of of the verdict was. Quite frankly, it it, it some now Mr. Chauvin is essentially going to lose a good chunk of his life too. We have many lives that were wrecked because of this, and if we don't use it as a teaching moment, I think we've all lost a, a great opportunity. You know, there was a lot of talk about uh, whether or not this jury should have been sequestered. Uh, in, in light of the Dante Wright uh, killing, the, the shooting that took place where the officer has stated that she confused her taser with her, you know, with her sidearm. 
you know, would have you sequestered that jury? From my experience, it's really hard to get that done. It's it's not common at all to get a jury sequestered. The, I understand that there's external forces playing around all of us and around this jury, but the the facts uh, of Mr. Floyd, Mr. Chauvin's case are not connected to any case that happened somewhere else in the country. And you have to trust the jury to make the right decision that they are going to do their their own uh, essentially self-sequestration, not look at the news, not pay attention to what's going on in the outside world, and assess the case that's in front of them. Is that, though, part of the argument that you would make as uh, Derek Chauvin's attorney if, if you wanted to make the argument that, hey, he should have sequestered them. We deserve an appeal. Here. That will 100% be an issue that's on appeal. As as the defense attorney, you have to say, hey, you can you can want the jury to do the right thing the whole time, not pay attention to the outside world. But let's be honest, especially you know we have our phones, our devices. We're constantly connected. Um, you can't even go on social media. You know, even if you want to go and pretend to look at pictures of your kids or something like that, there's going to be someone on there blaring out something about the news. So you, you can't escape it. It's, it's certainly going to be an appealable issue. I, at the end of the day, do I think it's going to win? No. I, uh, looking back, uh, you know, I, I'm sitting there wondering how they even found any jury whatsoever that didn't know more than what they knew with the Dante Wright case. I mean, everybody in the country knew what happened with Derek Chauvin. Everybody. Right. I mean, how do you find a jury? that can look at this uh, in a way where that they're impartial going in. It's it's incredibly hard to do with that. Before the trial even starts, you go through this process of voir dire, and each side, the defense and the prosecution, gets to ask potential jurors questions, and you have to try your best to fish out that bias. Um, there's a bunch of different strategies to try and do it. At the end of the day, both the defense and the prosecution, essentially you work together, even though you're adversarial, to find the best jury possible. Um, I, w I didn't watch this particular voir dire process, but I'm sure it was a very uh, fact-intensive search, backgrounds of individuals I'm sure were checked. Um, and, and at the end of the day, you're given a jury of your peers, and as your, the attorney, you have to do the best to find those people who have the biases and get them off the jury panel. And when we come back, we're going to talk about that jury. We're going to talk about the role and how their lives are going to be affected and what it's like to be a jury in that, in that jury box and, and have someone like a Scott Brand talking to them. How does that process work as we continue to head down the road? Howdy, folks. It's the Cantaline Cafe. I reckon it's time you're due for a hearty meal. So saddle up for the day with one of our hay boss and breakfast yeah. homemade soups. Fill your grill at a salad bar, sink your teeth into our famous Cantaline burger and barbecue ribs. Mm -hmm. Top it off with spur rattling pie with a calm roll that's sure to put a smile on even the toughest outlaws. Yeah. So shake the dirt off the boots each night and warm up with the game. Tell them about it, Stacy. I can't wait to see you at the county line. Hi, it's me, Anthony Sullivan. And yes, you've actually caught me at home relaxing because life's been pretty worry-free since I got coverage with American Residential Warranty. You won't believe what ARW covers. Heating and air conditioning, washers and dryers, kitchen appliances, plumbing, water heaters, electrical systems, flat screens and laptops, even pools and spas, and so much more. Call American Residential Warranty. They'll get you covered. 1-800-219-1467. Hi, Hunter Ellis here for Night Hero Binoculars by Atomic Beam. These binoculars let you see anything, even in pitch black darkness. Gotcha. The secrets are powerful wide angle atomic beam laser that reveals objects up to 150 yards away hidden by darkness. During the day, Night Hero gives you 10 times magnification. And when the sun goes down, press the night bright button to see clearly in the dark. Light up garbage eating critters or spot thieves before they even get close. Call or click now and get Night Hero binoculars for just $39.99. Order right now and you can double it. Plus, get our best selling atomic beam flashlight, just pay a separate fee. We'll even ship them to you free. This TV special offer is not available on Amazon. You can get it all, but you have to order now. Call 1-800-619-1091. That's 1-800-619-1091. Or visit ByNightHero.com. That's ByNightHero.com. Order now.
Attention, have you or a loved one suffered from maculopathy, a serious retinal injury, after taking the prescription drug Elmiron for interstitial cystitis or bladder pain syndrome? In 2018, a researcher at the Emory School of Medicine linked Elmiron, a prescription drug that treats interstitial cystitis or bladder pain syndrome, to maculopathy, which is sight-threatening and can cause an abrupt change of vision. Call Elmiron Justice for a free legal consultation. Please call 800-395-5680. Non-attorney spokesperson. This is a paid advertisement for legal services sponsored by Nightline Legal. Cases assigned on a random basis to participating law firms. This drug remains approved by the FDA. If you or a loved one regularly took Zantac and were later diagnosed with cancer, call right now. You may be entitled to financial compensation. Potential cancers include bladder cancer, colon cancer, kidney cancer, stomach cancer, liver cancer, pancreatic cancer. Do not stop taking a prescribed medication without first consulting with your doctor. Discontinuing a prescribed medication without your doctor's advice can result in injury or death. Call 1-800-230-9210. Guilty, guilty, and guilty. Uh, that's right. Uh, just a reminder, Derek Chauvin is, uh, is Chauvin. Uh, I've used the both names here. Uh, but I have to tell you this. Uh, it didn't surprise me uh, that he was found guilty of all three charges. Uh, I'm visiting with Scott Brand with Nielsen Brand Law Firm about just that. Scott's a defense attorney. And by the way, Scott, you're a former veteran uh, that you served in Iraq. Thank you for that. It was my honor. So... Um, in terms of that, to come back as a member of our military, serve in, you know, a foreign war, and to come back, how do you make that transition? I mean, to, 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 to go from that to find yourself in a whole other fight in a courtroom and debate in a courtroom, I mean, what's that like? Well, I think if you ask my parents, I've, I've always just been one to argue, so this was a natural fit for me. But um, I knew after I got back that I wanted to have a positive impact on, on people's lives, and um, I thought being a lawyer would, would be one of the best ways to do that. So I, it, it felt to me like a natural transition, I guess. I don't have a better way to explain it. I want to talk about the jury uh, in the Chauvin case. When, when you look at the role that those 12 individuals played, um, as someone who has argued in front of a jury, what's your thoughts on that? What, you know, in terms of what they go through, in terms of what's going to happen and has happened to their life? I can't imagine, and I have a, even though I, uh, I have a limited experience, just yesterday I was on a jury panel for a very short amount of time until it came out that I was a defense attorney, then they gave me the old boot, but um, I realized kind of for the first time how serious it is to be on a jury you all of a sudden realize that wow i'm going to be in charge of deciding essentially what happens to someone's life um and so it, it's a huge weight that's that's put on your shoulders and i think the judge i think he called it a heavy duty yesterday and i think that's accurate i mean especially for a case like this it might not feel so severe if it's a simple shoplifting case or something like that but um these jurors lives are going to be forever impacted even if they uh, come out to the public somehow or they get known, um, I mean, they're, gonna, they're essentially going to have to live with this decision for the rest of their lives as well. So as a defense attorney um, who's had to argue in front of jurors to, on behalf of his client, can you read them? Can, can you look at them and pick up whether something's working or not? We really try and do that at, during the voir dire process, especially. And oftentimes I have someone else in the courtroom helping me. So if I'm trying to make my arguments to someone, I want someone else looking at everyone else in the panel, who's nodding their head, you know, yes or no, or who's rolling their eyes, who's not paying attention. Um, so you try as hard as you can to do it, but I tell you what, when that jury comes back after deliberating, I can spend hours in just those seconds trying to analyze everything that's on their faces to see what they're gonna say. And there's been times where I've been surprised both ways with what they've come back with. Sure. Based on the look on their faces. Um, you know, w when you when you pick jurors, when you go through that, how many, how many, uh, boy, I'm not going to take him or her. I mean, yesterday, somebody said, no, he's a defense attorney. We don't need him on the jury. I mean, right. how does that process work? Well, uh, you can dismiss people initially uh, for cause. So let's say... For example, we had someone in the Chauvin case, you know what, I, I just don't like cops. I can't, I can't deal with them. Okay, well then obviously the, pro, uh, the uh, defense team's gonna be like, well, we want that guy off. He's too biased. So you can do that for cause. But then the other thing you have, it's called a peremptory uh, challenge, which essentially means, hey, 
maybe he didn't say that about the cops, but we don't think he's going to be legit. You know, maybe someone in my staff saw someone nodding along with the guy saying he doesn't like cops, or maybe there's someone who says he doesn't like black people. People will tell you those things sometimes straight up open and honest, that that's, that's their bias. Um, uh, if they're not, then it, it kind of turns into a guessing game, or if you want to, like fantasy sports, you can think you picked the right player, but at the end of the day, you don't know until they come back with that verdict. Do you ever, uh, when you look at that juror, do you ever pick up on the sense that, hey, that juror doesn't belong on this, you can tell he doesn't want to be on this, or sometimes is that the best one to get, that person that doesn't want to be in the room at all? From my experience, the person who doesn't want to be in the room is a person I don't want to be in the room either. And we actually had an instance one time where both myself and the prosecutor caught on to a particular juror. We're already past the voir dire. We're in trial. And he was not paying attention. He was dozing off like while witnesses important to both the defense prosecution were going. And we actually had a meeting uh, in chambers with the judge and said, here's the deal. This juror, you know, pick a number, juror number five, uh, is not paying attention. Can we just remove him? And then that's why you have sometimes an alternate on that panel. So we essentially just made the non-paying attention juror an alternate. We dismissed him, and then the alternate came in, and then, they, then that became the deliberating jury. What was his reaction? Was he... Happy? Was he mad? Was he, thank God I'm out of here? I think I saw an audible sigh of relief that he was released after we figured it out. I'm going to give you an example of what happened when, when I was called to jury duty. I don't remember the number, but I want to say it was as high as 60. Uh, names were called, you know, might right. have been, you know. But we're in a courtroom, and they're reading them off, and it's not alphabetical at all. It's not. Right. And, and so the last person they read off was me. The last person, uh, you know, and... So I'm like, okay, you know, maybe that's a good sign. They throw us all in a hat or a bucket or whatever, and the first name pulled out was me. Uh, you know, <laughs> so I'm sitting there because I did not want to be ever uh, on any jury. So I'm sitting there, and included in the 18 so they can get rid of six was my cousin. And, you know, my cousin clearly wanted to be on this jury. Uh, you know, and, and le same last name. You know, that type of thing. He's sitting there answering all the questions in a way where I'm just sitting there going, oh, man, how did I get drawn? And uh, finally, they look at him. They say, well, you work at this place of work, and so does the defendant. I mean, do you know him? Yep. He said, oh, not that well. We don't work that much together. And everybody broke out laughing, and they kicked him off. <laughs> and, and so then they look at me, and they say, well, you got the same last name. You both live in Manador. How well do you know him? I said, we talk every day. Every day, <laughs> everybody broke out laughing, and they kicked me off. And so we each got our 25 bucks and called her good for the day. But, it, you know, it, it seems to me that some of the removals or whatever you want to call them are pretty easy to make. Some of them are. And, and like I said, some people just come out and tell you, you know, like, hey, I, I hate that defendant. I mean, I've had that happen. Um, but then you... So those people are the easy ones, but you still have to sort through the whole panel and, and just make sure, because sometimes the people who don't say anything are maybe worse than the people who come out and say how exactly how they feel. But the reason I, I bring this into the conversation is because every one of those jurors knew about this case. They all knew about this right. case. It played out. In the, how do you find 12 people that are impartial on this case? I mean, I don't know how you do that. It, I, I do liken it a lot again to, to fantasy sports where you just try and your best to pick the people who are going to play the best for your case. Now, at the end of the day, just like in fantasy sports, are they going to be the best? You're not going to know. But it, it really does sometimes feel like a crapshoot. But um, good attorneys, you do the background checks on people. We check social media accounts to see if there's stuff that you're not telling us. We see where you work. As you mentioned, your cousin got called out for where he works. Uh, we try and figure out as much about you as we can to make sure that you're impartial. Okay, so now you're, you know, as we look upon the appeal here and as we right. try to find out, you know, what happens, the judge specifically talked about Maxine Waters, Congresswoman from California, and how she injected herself into this trial uh, by her calling for people to stay on the streets until they get the verdict they want. Uh, you know, should the judge have done that, number one? And number two, will that help with the appeal? From my understanding, is I believe the jury was already sequestered at the time uh, Ms. Waters made those comments. I think that those were very unfortunate comments that she made. They should have never been made. You have to let the jury do their work. 
making headlines and stuff like that helps no one. And hopefully this is a lesson that she learns from this, is that now there probably is going to be an appealable issue on it. Um, I would also have preferred the judge not comment on it either. Let the process work itself through. Um, he's not going to be the one handling the appeal, so it's really not his uh, point to make. That's for an appellate uh, court to decide. Well, uh, if you think that she's going to learn from it, you're wrong. <laughs> uh, I, I've known Maxine Water. I've known about Maxine Waters for a long time. Uh, Wesley Morgan when we, uh, joins us when we come back down the road. We're going to talk about uh, military service. We're going to talk about the Peck Valley. We're going to talk about Afghanistan when we come back right here down the road. Hey, everybody. I'm Doug Billings, your host of The Right Side with Doug Billings on Beck News. We bring you high profile guests, ladies and gentlemen, exclusive guests. Now, you're not going to see these guests in most of the mainstream media outlets. Another thing that I do here is give guests a platform to speak freely. You're not going to see me censor anybody. Please join us, won't you? Weeknights right here on Beck TV and online at Beck.News. Cheers. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, and as you know, my passion is to help each and every one of you get the best sleep of your life. That's why I created my new Giza Dreams bed sheets. The first night you sleep on my sheets, you'll never want to sleep on anything else. Go to MyPillow.com or call the number on your screen right now to get your very own MyPillow Giza Dream sheets. When you buy one set of sheets, you'll get another set absolutely free. For the best night's sleep in the whole wide world, visit MyPillow.com. Introducing the Cool Turtle, the ultra comfortable mask enhancer that creates a protective, cool, and breathable space between your mask and your face. Simply slide under any mask or gaiter and immediately feel the refreshing pocket of air surrounding your face. Cool Turtle's ergonomically designed soft, comfortable shell immediately reduces mask friction, allowing you to breathe and talk in a comfortable environment. I can actually breathe. With the Cool Turtle, no more sweating. It's like I don't even have a mask on. Call now and get not one, not two, but three cool turtles for just $10. Order now and we'll send you two more cool turtles free. No fees, absolutely free. Plus, you can get a 10-pack of four-ply face masks. Just pay a separate fee. This offer is not available on Amazon. Get the real cool turtle now. Call 1-800-270-1219. That's 1-800-270-1219. Or visit at coolturtle.com. Order now. <laughs> Indoor football is back in Bismarck. Bucks football season is right around the corner. Grab a friend or family member for a night of action-packed, hard-hitting entertainment. The Bucks open at the Bismarck Event Center May 8th as they take on the Massachusetts Pirates. Catch the sweetest seats in the house right on the sidelines with VIP service at a Bucks turf table. Available now for single-game purchases. Secure your tickets today by calling 701-595-0771. Bucks football, half the field and double the fun. I'm Rick Becker from No Apologies. Welcome to your After Hours Oasis of Sanity. How can, how can these people not see that they're just clowns? <laughs> we help simplify and educate you on things going on in the legislature and around the country. Asking the hard-hitting questions. But also having Flea Stack and Sid and Marty Croft stuff, and we've talked about that sometimes. <laughs> it's bad. Watch us weeknights at 9 Central on Beck News and online at Beck.News. Welcome back to Down the Road. I have somebody that's, well, he's very interesting. Uh, you know, he's an author. Uh, he wrote The Hardest Place, The American Military Adrift in Afghans, Afghanistan's Peck Valley. And uh, had a chance to find out uh, his work or uh, be told about his work from, from many people. Uh, that that really respect what he's done to cover all of this, and that's uh, Wesley Morgan. Wesley, good to have you coming down the road with us. Thanks so much for having me, Joel. Tell me about the book. Uh, tell me uh, what this is all about. Sure. So it's a book that covers 20 years of war in one small part of Afghanistan, um, but a part that I think is pretty emblematic of many issues in the rest of the country. It's a place called the Petch Valley. It's up in Afghanistan's northeast. Um, and a lot of really tough battles of the war have happened here. Uh, you know, some of your viewers may be familiar with the movie Lone Survivor. Uh, that takes place in the Korangal Valley, which is one of the tributaries of the Petch. Uh, there's the Battle of Want or Wanat that happened in 2008, where nine American paratroopers were killed. 
Uh, that's also in one of the tributaries of the patch. Uh, so the book really kind of traces back the origins of U.S. involvement in this place, uh, which I call the hardest place because of the incredible terrain uh, and vegetation there that just make it really difficult to operate. Uh, it traces back those origins to the months after 9-11 uh, and then up through uh, last year, really. Tell people about your role in that, what, what you did to cover that and where you've been. Sure. So, um, you know, about a decade ago, um, or I guess more than a decade ago now, I first went to Iraq in 2007 as an embedded reporter, um, freelancing, you know, just uh, selling articles to whichever publications were interested on that particular trip, uh, and then and started going to Afghanistan and doing the same thing uh, in 2009. And so what I would do is I would, you know, I'd take a trip of a few months, um, and I would go and bounce around the country embedding with different um, U.S. Army and Marine Corps uh, infantry units. Um, and just covering their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, I would, you know, I'd visit a battalion of say 700 soldiers that lives in a, a handful of outposts in some rural Afghan district uh, and spend a few weeks just bouncing around, visiting different platoons and outposts and seeing what their lives were like. Uh, and it was one of these trips that took me up to the, the Pesh Valley, which is the place that I got kind of hooked on. It, is it hard to get that type of access? Um, you're out there covering, you, the U.S. military is in charge. Obviously, these troops are, are there on behalf of the U.S. military and, and the American people. I mean, to just be able to, to go along, interact, and be able to tell those stories, uh, uh, how do you get that type of access? Well, at the height of our wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, the Pentagon actually provided this access um, to a very wide range of journalists. I mean, everybody from national news outlets to young freelancers like myself uh, to local news outlets. Uh, from states that had National Guard units activated or the home communities of, you know, of large bases. So 10, 15 years ago, this was very common. And the Pentagon had, you know, they allowed a lot of reporters this kind of access. Now it's much harder. And uh, what little embedding there is these days um, is much more of a kind of a curated visit where you're watched over by, a, you know, a public affairs minder who follows you everywhere. Um, so it's a very different thing in the past you know, five years. We started to see that change in like 2013. So really, there's no question whether or not, you know, you were in harm's way, whether or not you were, you were in danger with it. Was there ever a time that you were like, what the heck did I do putting myself here? I mean, was there ever a time that, quite frankly, you were afraid? Yeah, I mean, certainly there were times when I was afraid, um, times when uh, soldiers were killed and wounded around me. Um, I think I was, in, in stark terms, I was always quite safe uh, in the sense that I was in the company of uh, well-trained American and British infantrymen. Um, sometimes I was embedded with Afghan National Army units, which um, was scarier in different ways. Um, you know, there used to be a phenomenon of a Afghan, uh, Afghan soldiers turning on the Americans who were working with them and training with them. And that's something I saw in Iraq once with the Iraqi soldiers. So certainly there were times when I was afraid. Um, I, I think, um, you know, th there were moments, you know, what to be flying into the country for one of these trips where I think, wait, am I doing this again? Uh, but then once I was kind of out, um, out in the field with troops, I mean, it was a really fun and rewarding thing um, to be able to share a little bit of their lives with them and, and, and see what they're doing under these incredibly difficult circumstances at very young ages. You know, Afghanistan, as you know, has a real history, uh, a history of nations that uh, one might think are way stronger, way more powerful and have a way bigger military trying to take on a certain aspects of the Afghan people and losing. Um, I, I think that Russia might uh, kind of scratch her head and say, what the heck were we ever in Afghanistan for? And so, you know, where were we in that context? Uh, where were we in, in terms of being able to complete the mission in your eyes? You know, I think that the question comes down to what the mission is, uh, and that's something that's always been a very convoluted question for the United States in Afghanistan. Uh, and that's a story that the book tells, is that the United States went into Afghanistan uh, nearly 20 years ago in the fall of 2001 uh, with a narrow core mission, trying to find uh, the al-Qaeda leaders who had planned the September 11th attacks and bring them to justice and prevent them from uh, using Afghanistan for similar attacks again. But almost from the outset, it was also part of a bigger, much more expansive and amorphous mission um, of counterinsurgency and nation building, where we overthrew the Taliban regime that was harboring Al Qaeda, uh, and then tr tried to underwrite uh, a new government to replace it. 
so, so this really has all along been both an exercise in counterterrorism, you know, going after particular Al Qaeda and ISIS leaders, uh, and also an exercise in, in a much more ambitious project of nation building. You know, you, you talk about in the title, quite frankly, uh, the American military adrift. Um, what does that mean uh, to, to the people that are viewing you right now? Uh, when, they're, when they read the American military adrift in Afghanistan's Peck Valley, or, you know, w what does that mean to them? Sure. I, I chose the word adrift in the title because uh, to me it, 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 it uh, represents um, what was going on even starting more than a decade ago in Afghanistan in this part of the country where the U.S. forces realized uh, that in this valley they were really not accomplishing their objectives anymore. Um, but we're still stuck there. And it took, uh, there was a long period between that realization and when they left. Uh, and in some cases, they were then drawn back in. But so, for example, there's uh, the little valley called the Korangal that flows south from the Pech Valley, um, where the documentary Restrepo was filmed, um, where the Lone Survivor episode takes place. Really, by the summer of 2008, um, the, the U.S. commander in, in the valley, uh, a guy named Lieutenant Colonel Brett Jenkinson at the time, was pretty convinced uh, that U.S. troops had worn out their welcome and were not accomplishing anything in the Korangal Valley uh, besides uh, just creating, creating and getting into firefights, um, you know, with people who uh, were essentially just mountain people defending their, their territory and their lumber business. Uh, but it took nearly two more years uh, for the top U.S. commanders in Kabul to actually sign off on leaving that valley. I think we see a little bit of the, the same phenomenon at play in the bigger war in more recent years, um, where a, a lot of you know, soldiers and officers uh, who, who have rotated through Afghanistan, I think, have, um, have come back with real bitterness uh, at, at feeling like w what we're doing there is, is not accomplishing its goals. Uh, and yet one administration after another has found it difficult, if not impossible, to extricate themselves from the country. So, you know, and I won't involve you in the domestic politics of should we pull the troops, when shouldn't we pull the troops. You know, the Trump administration, you know, saying they were going to pull the troops, then somebody uh, giving pushback on that, uh, you know, and now the Biden administration obviously saying we will pull the troops and we will pull them by, by a certain day. But I am going to ask you this. What is it about Afghanistan that the American people don't know and don't understand? I think one thing that it's very easy for Americans to forget is that in large part, it's not our war and the war there will not end when we leave. Um, it's a very complicated war. It's an incredibly bloody war. The Afghan government, its army and police, uh, they lose 10,000 soldiers a year fighting the Taliban. Uh, the United States has lost 2,500 soldiers there this whole time. Um, so I think the, the sheer scale of the human suffering um, that's going on there beyond the sacrifices of American troops um, is something that it's easy to lose sight of uh, if, if you have if you haven't been there and kind of and haven't haven't served alongside um, Af Afghan soldiers as many American soldiers have you know fought right there alongside with them. Mr. Morgan, tell people where to find your work. Tell them where to find the book. Anywhere books are sold, uh, Amazon, your local bookstore, even better. Thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. Wesley Morgan, ladies and gentlemen. When we come back, Bill Warner's going to join us from the Minnesota News Network. He's there. He's in the heart of the Twin Cities. We'll find out what his take was on the verdict and what he sees on ground uh, down in Minneapolis. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell. And as you know, my passion is to help each and every one of you get the best sleep of your life. That's why I created my new Giza Dreams bed sheets. I started by using the world's best cotton called Giza. It's only grown in a region between the Sahara Desert, the Mediterranean Sea, and the Nile River. It's ultra soft and breathable, but extremely durable. My Giza sheets also include full 21 inch wide pillowcases that will fit over any pillow and deep pocket sheets that will fit over any mattress. The first night you sleep on my sheets, you'll never want to sleep on anything else. Go to MyPillow.com or call the number on your screen right now to get your very own MyPillow Giza Dream Sheets. Giza Dream Sheets are available in a variety of colors. Use your promo code and for a limited time, when you buy one set of sheets, you'll get another set absolutely free. For the best night's sleep in the whole wide world, visit MyPillow.com.
Non-attorney spokesperson. This is a paid advertisement for legal services sponsored by Nightline Legal. Cases assigned on a random basis to participating law firms. This drug remains approved by the FDA. If you or a loved one regularly took Zantac and were later diagnosed with cancer, call right now. You may be entitled to financial compensation. Potential cancers include bladder cancer, colon cancer, kidney cancer, stomach cancer, liver cancer, pancreatic cancer. Do not stop taking a prescribed medication without first consulting with your doctor. Discontinuing a prescribed medication without your doctor's advice can result in injury or death. Call 1-800-230-9210. Seniors, are you aware that you could pay less for your car insurance? Seniors can save money on their car insurance. You might save a little, you might save a lot. Maybe hundreds of dollars a year. You might save 5% a year, maybe 10%, 15%, or even more. That's a lot of money. So call right now and find out just how much money you might be able to save. 1-800-699-0761. 1-800-699-0761. Hi, it's me, Anthony Sullivan. And yes, you've actually caught me at home relaxing because life's been pretty worry-free since I got coverage with American Residential Warranty. You won't believe what ARW covers. Heating and air conditioning, washers and dryers, kitchen appliances, plumbing, water heaters, electrical systems, flat screens and laptops, even pools and spas, and so much more. Call American Residential Warranty. They'll get you covered. 1-800-219-1467. Watch No Filter with me, Debbie Schlussel, for no-nonsense, unfiltered analysis of the news that matters to you. You'll see engaging guests. It began a 444-day nightmare. Entertaining analysis. And it has everything to do with something that happened in history. And honest movie reviews. Trust me, this is just atrocious. No Filter with Debbie, weeknights at 10 p.m. Central on Beck News and online at Beck.News. Welcome back to Down the Road. We've had Bill Werner on with us before. Bill's with the Minnesota News Network, and um, he's a voice. He's somebody that I've respected his work for a long, long time. Uh, When that comes across the airways, I I stop uh, because I know I'm going to get journalism. Uh, And that's one of the reasons I love having him come down the road with us. Bill, good to have you back on. I appreciate it. Thank you for your kind comments there, Joel, too. And and it's always good to be with you folks. Thank you. I want a chance to talk to you about yesterday. Guilty, guilty, and guilty. Uh, (laughs) Did that surprise you? Um, No, it did not. And I'll I'll tell you why. up until um, we actually heard, middle of the afternoon, it was about 2.30ish, I think, yesterday afternoon, right? Maybe right around then, maybe a little bit before then, that we heard that the jury had a verdict. After only 10 hours of de- deliberations, well, the mind immediately goes then to, well, if they only took that short an amount of time, relatively short amount of time, right, compared to some criminal trials that deliberations go on for days or even weeks in some cases, I think, uh, but but having it that fast seemed to indicate that that they had had a uh, uh, probably looked at the evidence and said no that it was overwhelming and and had made their decision and and some analysts that we talked to I talked to David Schultz uh, the um, uh, constitutional law professor at Hamlin University who is our um, in, intrepid uh, indefatigable consultant on these matters and. and and I was actually interviewing him on, on some on, on on something else uh, that we were going to use prior to the announcement of the verdict, just just about hey, what 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 are the implications of this and so on. And then I got the word that the um, uh, that, that the verdict was going to be announced in an hour, an hour and a half. And Professor Schultz almost gasped. And I said, "What does this mean, Professor?" And he says, "I think it might mean guilty on all counts." And he was indeed correct in that. Uh, but 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 the the tension is just palpable when you, it, it, it's such a clinical process, right? It, it's detached, dispassionate. The the verdict is 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 presented by the foreman. The judge uh, then then reads the verdict and and, um, and, and to, to see the the guilty, guilty, and guilty. Um, I, I think you could almost sense um, this great big collective. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. And b- because people were really, there was a lot of tension about the possibility of, of violence if it had been the other way. If we had just had a, 
Uh, and even we in the media didn't want to really say that, right? I mean, the implication was out there, um, but, but you don't want to do anything that might change the course of events, you just, right? And people can draw their own conclusions. But, uh, but I think um, if it had been uh, only a manslaughter verdict, I think you probably would have, would have, would have seen violence, uh, to be honest with you. Um, the, but the murder conviction, particularly the second degree murder conviction, made the difference there. So when that happened, because I was in the same place, and I had to continue to remind myself as a radio host and a TV host that it was about justice. It wasn't about my personal beliefs, which was uh, that Derek Chauvin was guilty. I, I believed, and I earlier, uh, even before I heard the trial, that, that he was guilty. He was guilty of murder. Uh, but that being said, everybody deserves that trial and what was going to come out in that trial. And, and so after it played out, there were many of us whose opinion didn't change. Uh, it, it certainly didn't change. If, that, if it had been manslaughter instead of murder, what would downtown Minneapolis, how would have it reacted? And did, were you surprised at all that everything last night was peaceful? I was not surprised that it was peaceful last night. If, if the verdict had, if it had been not guilty, or perhaps uh, uh, if it had been um, guilty on only one count, such as the manslaughter, uh, I don't, I mean, I, I'm sitting here six blocks, basically right on the edge of downtown Minneapolis. And um, so uh, six blocks from Hennepin County Government Center where the trial took place and two block walk from the Nicollet Mall and where all the destruction took place last summer too, right? And the windows are all boarded up. And I, I, th I think you potentially would have seen more of that. Now, law enforcement had a real strong presence. Uh, and, and the idea was to, uh, to buy that strong presence, say, hey, if, if there's any trouble, you're not going to be able to go get very far with it. But that aside, these things can pop out all over the place, particularly with social media. Um, I mean, these groups are communicating via social media and, and are able to, I mean, that's, that's a big logistical uh, uh, help to them. Uh, they are probably have as much help in terms of, or probably have as much capability in terms of communications as the police do, yeah. <laughs> right? So that tells you something. Uh, but given that the verdict was as it was, guilty, 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 no, I, I was not surprised that there was not in any violence. However, I, I, it, one thing just gave me pause, and that was possibly that there might be some extremist groups that were of a very different opinion about what should have happened in terms of the verdict who might try to, uh, this is not the right word, but try to spoil the celebration. Okay, by those Exploit who- Exploit the situation. That's exactly right. Now, the one thing is, I have to assume that the state public safety officials had their ear to the ground and ear to the internet and every play it's else and had, had anticipated that as well. And those groups in terms of physical numbers are quite small compared to the potential outrage that could have been brought to bear if the verdicts had been not guilty not guilty, not guilty. Bill, I'm going to bring up a scenario in my life. Uh, you know, I live uh, in the, the very southeast corner of North Dakota. If I go through Elbow Lake, I am only three hours from you. I can get to downtown Minneapolis pretty fast. You, and, you, uh, you're fairly within close striking distance, Exactly. Right? If, if I'm a Viking season ticket holder. My mm -hmm. prayer, because I share them with another guy, or did, I should point out, he wanted out. He didn't want to come to downtown Minneapolis anymore. And it wasn't it wasn't always just fear. I don't believe that. I think in, in some part he was ticked off. A and so is downtown Minneapolis going to recover from that? <laughs> it, it's, it's not something I'm afraid to go to or ticked off to go to as much as what I know there are others who aren't going to go there. Does downtown Minneapolis recover from that? You know, Joel, you ask a, a very important question, and without getting too far into a history lesson, I have been uh, cognizant of downtown Minneapolis since I was very young uh, in the 1960s when they did the Gateway District teardown, right, the urban renewal project, and downtown languished for a long period of time after that. And finally, oh, it started about the IDS tower going up, Mary Tyler Moore, that kind of thing. You started getting getting the momentum building, and it built to a real fever pitch through the well through the 90s and 2000s, and even even the 2010s. And then we had we had COVID, 
and COVID was the thing that really first made the difference here, right, in downtown Minneapolis. And so because the office workers aren't here anymore, most of them aren't and still aren't back. And some of them are never going to return. They're going to remain home. And then the, uh, the Derek Chauvin case and all of the unrest from that was a, a one-two punch. Uh, so, so you have a situation here. You've got a, you've got a, a large metropolitan area with a downtown that is relatively small compared to other cities of similar size. This is not a, a, a downtown the size of, of um, a Chicago, as an example. So how much of a hit can it take? <laughs> you know, uh, it, it remains to be seen. Uh, and also it's even beyond the trial itself and all the violence that occurred from that and the destruction downtown and, and even worse destruction elsewhere and Lake Street as an example in Minneapolis. But it's really a, a, a question then of even beyond that, the social forces, what the COVID pandemic, uh, it changed the normal, totally changed the normal, right? It, it, uh, workers said, yeah, I got to work from home because it's, it's safe. I have to be safe. And employers, it's, a number of employers now have realized that, well, they can work from home. And in some ways, that's a more efficient way to do things and on and on and on like that. So do we ever get these, I don't know what the number was, a couple hundred thousand people on a daily basis coming into downtown Minneapolis, I think is the number, somewhere mm -hmm. around there, pre-pandemic. Uh, maybe maybe less than that, but I'll we'll just use that as a, as a reference point. Where does it end up coming back at? Yeah, well, I, I can tell you this. My wife, uh, who worked in an office building with uh, managing a lot of people, she'll never be back in an office building again. That's, uh, that's she right. Will, she's gonna work from home. Bill. Always good to talk to you, man. Uh, thanks, and Everybody stay safe. Stay, stay. Okay, you guys too, all right? Bill Werner, Minnesota News Network. When we come back, some closing comments about whether or not first responders deserve health care in, per in perpetuity when they have lost their loved one right after this. Do you worry about going to the dentist? After all, a visit to the dentist can easily cost $2,000 or more. Well, relax. The Carefree Dental Card is now available in your area. Call now and we'll send your actual card at no cost today. With the Carefree Dental Card, you go to the dentist whenever you need and you instantly pay a lot less. Activate your card and you can start using it immediately. From exams and cleanings to more expensive procedures like crowns, dentures, even braces, they're all included with the Carefree Dental Card. Say you go to the dentist today without any card and your bill is, well, ouch. Wait a minute, let's try that again. You go to the dentist today and show your Carefree Dental Card, you save $525. The Carefree Dental Card is just $15.95 a month, so call now and make going to the dentist carefree. Call 1-800-416-5739 to receive your Carefree Dental Card Information Kit. 1-800-416-5739. Call now. I can't say enough good things about these nano hearing aids. Real people talking about nano hearing aids. The hearing quality is great. Until now, hearing aids used to be too expensive for the average person. Until nano. Call now and you'll get your nano hearing aids for only $297. You'll save $100. When you buy one hearing aid, nano will give you a second hearing aid free. Call right now. 1-800-213-3815. Spas, etc. Yeah, yeah. You've come to know and trust us for over 18 years with the largest selection and showroom in Western North Dakota for our beautiful Sundance spas. Plus, you can pick out your next home experience with our selection of pool tables, chuckle boards, and fun accessories. Spas, etc. Your relaxation destination on Maiden and Bismarck. Who do you trust with your digital life? Not all cloud backup providers keep your data truly private. Beck Cloud Backup uses advanced multi-layer encryption to keep your family photos, videos, and sensitive business documents secure and only for your eyes. Your Beck Lightband Internet service already includes 50 gigs of free storage to keep your digital life safe and secure. Call us at 701-475-2361 to start using your Beck Cloud Backup today. Attention, have you or a loved one suffered from maculopathy, a serious retinal injury, after taking the prescription drug Elmiron for interstitial cystitis or bladder pain syndrome? In 2018, a researcher at the Emory School of Medicine linked Elmiron, a prescription drug that treats interstitial cystitis or bladder pain syndrome, to maculopathy, which is sight-threatening and can cause an abrupt change of vision. 
Call Elmiron Justice for a free legal consultation. Please call 800-395-5680. You know, you're going to recognize uh, the voice and you're going to recognize the face. Jim Shaw is going to be in this chair tomorrow. Uh, Jim's a longtime newsman. He was a, a reporter out on the streets for uh, WDAY TV and then he went to KVRR. And so he's got a real background in doing things like this. And I think he's going to enjoy being on Beck News. Uh, and I think he's going to be a tool that we can use quite often as we go down the road. Uh, but uh, today I want to talk to you about House Bill 14. Uh, 53. Now, it's a law. It's a law. What that bill does is it takes anyone that is a fallen first responder. In this case, I want to give the example of Officer Holty uh, in Grand Forks, who was shot in the line of duty and killed. Okay? This bill makes sure that Officer Holty's family has life insurance. Okay? That's what this bill does. It recognizes that the North Dakota PERS, that the North Dakota's plan when it comes to its health insurance can sure afford to have a couple of more people on it that we can support when their husband, their father, their family member died in the line of duty serving us. It's a good bill. And it's a bill that passed. It passed overwhelmingly. Uh, and the governor signed it in a ceremony in the Great Hall uh, yesterday. Now, here's the thing. One of the individuals that voted against it that you're looking at right now is wearing pink on the left side. Her name is Kathy Scraw. Kathy Scraw uh, represents District 26 in the North Dakota legislature. Kathy Scraw is one of the most conservative Republicans that you can get. And she was there celebrating the signing, celebrating Doug Burgum putting pen to paper and that family watching behind him. Kathy Scraw voted against the bill. She voted against the bill and yet she squeezed in to make sure she could get the kudos it was ribbon cutting time ladies and gentlemen and kathy scraw wanted to be part of that now her response was i forgot i forgot how i voted well one of two things there number one she could be lying number two if she did forget she shouldn't be sitting in one of those chairs and i want to point this out kathy scraw works part-time for this state and she gets that health insurance she does so number three she's a hypocrite we'll see you back here on friday jim shaw tomorrow good riding with you folks